So well, that's uh, cool. A good reason to do open source software. Yeah, man. Actually, I didn't even set that up, so just hit the button so it's not up. Oh, yeah. It's like this one. Robert Dempsey, thanks. Yo! <laughs> good evening. <coughs> Alright, so I'm Robert Dempsey. Um, this talk is Understanding Clients Better Through Data. I figured that's a better title than like how to build your own personal prism, just depending on how you feel. <laughs> you might think that's funny, you might not. Thank you for some laughter. All right, so actually, I'm the director of engagement at Intridia, and that's okay because Matt doesn't know me from Adam. Um, so I can't answer highly technical questions. However, I have been doing Ruby and Rails for about eight years, Python for about three. Um, and that's my link there, and that's me right in front of you. So a little bit about Intridia. We're a custom web and mobile application development shop. We have an office about two blocks away from the White House. We work with... A lot of clients you might know, Mitsubishi, Verizon, <clears throat> Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Large people, ADP in general, uh, Dynamics, just to name a few of our latest ones. And we do custom mobile and web apps. And that's enough about that, so let me get to the talk. Uh, basically, here was my challenge. I just started with the company about three months ago. I've worked for myself for the better part of 14 years. But I was brand new. We had over 77 existing clients, bringing on at least a couple new clients per month. We have company accounts on uh, most social media networks. Uh, the way that we get our clients is both top down and bottom up, meaning like we have a crap ton of open source software out there that a lot of people have been using. For instance, if you ever heard of OmniAuth, if you're in the Ruby world, uh, we created that years ago. It's like a standard authentication library used in Ruby. So a lot of the development community knows us, but we also go after kind of like the top level C-suite people. So it's okay, I gotta figure out right, like who all these people are and how to get to them because I'm a sales and marketing guy. And the thing was, was that there was not nearly enough info in our existing CMS for me. I didn't put it in the slide, but basically that's like, there was nothing, it was, it was pathetic, there was very little. So you know, the challenge is that right, I got, you know, I'm a sales and marketing guy, but I don't wanna be all douchey about sales and marketing because techie people hate sales and marketing people, like I did. So I came up with a theory. I'm like, all right, so my theory is the more data I have on these folks, the better I can understand them, the less kind of like a-hole-ish I have to be, right? And I can figure out what kind of content is going to attract these folks to our website, what tools and services can we offer to people, what other open source software could we put out there that's going to help get us more people. So I had a few goals um, when I started to develop because I have an engineering background, so my first idea is, hey, I'm going to build an app, or I'm going to build a lot of apps, which is actually what I ended up doing, and they're all tied together, but anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. So the goals are, I wanted to better understand our clients through data and actual like conversations that we have on social media. I want to use that information to create content and tools for similar companies and people, meaning, what do these people that I know have paid us money in the past like? So what might other people that are like them that might pay us money in the future, what might they like? And then ultimately, right, i got to get more clients or I'm going to get fired and have no job. So the tech involved. Um, as I said, I'm a Ruby and Python guy, so I use both Ruby and Python for data gathering. For visualization, I'm using Tableau, which is a Windows-based like business application. However, I will say that I am keeping Windows where it belongs in a VM on my Mac. So, <laughs> however you feel about that, that's how I put it. Um, and also using Python and R, because especially when it comes to data, right, there's like everything known to man and unman is in Python, and R you can just create plots ungodly easily once you load the data, once you have the data in a good format. For storage, I'm using MongoDB for everything because frankly it's easy. I have multiple types of data that I'm pulling in. I have like one database, multiple collections of stuff. So I have like a collection for tweets. I have a collection for um, this Surfiki data, which I'll get into in a minute. I have a collection for LinkedIn data, for Facebook data, et cetera, et cetera. And so I don't have to worry about like in Ruby on Rails doing my data migrations or anything like that. I can just get data wholesale. Typically I flatten it out and then I shove it into Mongo and it's a happy camper. Sources of data that I'm pulling in are CMS, like if there is data in the CMS, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Analytics currently, and Surfiki. Now, Surfiki is something you probably haven't heard of. Um, our director of, or actually our managing director of engineering, Anthony, created this thing. And what it is is it's basically a massive like data collection tool. And I'm using it for what I call Google Alerts on steroids. But essentially, right now, we have multiple 
data sets that are in Surfiki. We're scanning about 70 or 80,000 surface web um, places as well. So it's a way to like come in um, and visualize data, get trend information on data. We have a lot of like metrics to come uh, for all of the data and I have a little bit of that in, the, uh, in here as well. And that's free to use actually right now. So all the data that I'm using. This is a, definitely not a big data project. So far I have like everything is in the thousands, um, like thousands and that's not even, that'd be like minuscule data, I guess you could say. Uh, but it's good data and I like it. So I'm getting for all of our clients, any leads, anyone else that I just care to follow um, with or without them knowing about it, I get all their tweets using one of our Ruby gems called TweetStream. So if their account is mentioned or they mention anything, put anything out there on Twitter, I capture all of that. LinkedIn, I can scrape company and personal profiles. Uh, there's some, like again in Ruby, there's some gems to grab some of that data, but otherwise I've written custom Python scrapers to just get anything off the page. Um, and getting, uh, what you can get is always based on privacy settings. So no matter what, don't worry. I'm not like gonna get out and like get your data that you have hidden anywhere. If you have a privacy setting on it, then there's no way anyone can get it anyway. Google Analytics, I'm getting stuff like content, keywords, and location. So from Surfiki, I'm getting, as I said, like Google alerts on steroids. And also from our CMS, I get stuff like address, deals that we have going on, etc. cetera. Um, and then I like geocode that and all that. So basically how it works, pretty simple setup. Twitter, LinkedIn, Surfiki, CMS, etc. Going into MongoDB, and then I visualize all that with Tableau, Python, and R. So that's how it flows in. So this is an example, actually, of what I get out of Surfiki. So extremely hard to read, um, especially in the back. But essentially, on a daily basis, if anyone mentioned any one of the people that I am tracking, then I get a link to the website where it's mentioned. There's a description. I get sentiment analysis, opinion, like is it objective, subjective, etc. And then some other metrics like how easy is it to read, word count, et cetera, et cetera. So I can really look at the quality of the data sources talking about um, our clients or the leads or whoever. So that's pretty fun. So a little bit of charty goodness of what I can show. So really, I mean, it's just like kind of pretty basic stuff if you've ever used Tableau. So this is, um, I don't even know what they call it. It's like a tree, tree chart. Someone? Tree map. Thank you very much. Um, so... You know, so I can easily look at, okay, you know, how many, cli how many clients in each industry do we have? Um, so I got this basically by going in and scraping all of the LinkedIn data, company pages for each of our clients, if they had it. And then I could produce this tree map right here. And then I can also look at, okay, well, where are our clients um, also? So, you know, we can see, yeah, we're, you know, we're located in D.C., so we have a lot of clients in... Uh, Virginia, that's pretty straightforward. California, right? We've worked with startups and whatnot in the past. So looking at this gave me a general overview of, okay, where are these people? So it's like, who are these people? And I could also get revenue numbers and all sorts of other data. Where are these people? And then this is impossible to read. But basically, I'm looking at, by state, what industry are the people in? Because if anyone, is anyone else here in sales and marketing? No? Right on. Okay. But I thought everyone's in sales, aren't you? Right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so, you know, basically once you know, like, who's where and what they're interested in, you can buy mailing lists if you wanted to and all that. We're not really into that, but it's good to know all this information. And then I looked at our Google Analytics information, and I'm like, okay, so how have we been doing since, you know, 2008? And we were kicking ass back here in 2011, and we were like Inc. 500 back then. And then, you know, shit happened. And it's not as, as good as it was, but I'm working on that. Uh, but, and, also, and this also doesn't come from, uh, this is where our Twitter followers are. This doesn't come from any of the tools that I mentioned. It comes from a tool called Follower Wonk, where you can basically pull up either, you can analyze your Twitter following or like your competitor's Twitter following, which is even more fun. Um, so this is one of those to look at a map of, okay, where are our Twitter followers? So then I can say, okay, are the same people that are like following us on Twitter, are they the same people that are actually our clients? Or are we connecting with people on social media that we're not connecting with another way? So then I can find that out and then talk to those people. So more fun with data not shown. 
Uh, basically, what I'm doing kind of offline is correlating the client intelligence that I have with like lead conversion data. One of the things I want to get into is creating actually a network graph of who's connected to who on both LinkedIn and Twitter because you can grab all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, looking at you know, sponsoring and speaking at more of the right conferences and then writing more blog posts and measuring conversion rates of that. So, that's it. That's the whole talk. That's how I'm creating my own little personal prison program, and you can too. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, for the MongoDB, you had all those different data sources. Were all, were all those put into different collections in MongoDB? Yeah, so, yeah, so literally each one of those is its own collection. Okay. And so ultimately, one of the things too that I'm working on is using, um, when Ra it's like Rails and then Backbone and Marionette, if y'all have ever heard of that, because essentially I'm creating like a real-time dashboard that'll plug in all these collections so I can just literally fire up a web page, see, okay, what's been said, what's the latest um, that we've found on the web that people are saying about our clients, and then what's the other information. And follow up, you're using Mongo to be on the command line to then do your run your queries and, or you're using the MapReduce mechanisms within MongoDB? So far, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Have you taken the next step? You collect what is fine data from multiple sources, the process and the display and so forth, but that's mm -hmm. all done for purpose. What you mentioned is you increase sales. Mm -hmm. So you, are you going to take the next step and say, okay, with this data, I'm going to try to do this and just get this data. <coughs> so some type of additional decision support system or some type of something to do with the data itself. Yeah, so essentially, am I going to use this to help me determine like who to talk to? Mm. Yeah, that's what I mean. You just have to have a program like you have one. So you just take the next part of the supply chain and actually use that data to execute something. Yeah, so good question. Um, one of the things that I'm working on right now is making all this tie in also with our website. So basically, what would happen is if anyone fills out our contact form, it goes into our CMS, then my system automatically grabs that and then scrapes and spiders like all of their data. Um, and then before I contact someone, I would look at all of that and have a good um, idea of like who it is exactly that I'm talking to. Now, I don't think that answers your question though. Well, that's the step towards what you want because again, the initial goal was for you to collect information. So when you talk to these people, you better prepared to sell them the product. Right. If I know any background, that helps you do so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, right, I mean, marketing and sales is all about people, right? And it's all about making those connections with people. So I figure the better that I can understand those folks and where they're coming from, then the better of a conversation that I can have when I talk to them. And so then I don't have to do, like, you know, stupid yeah, marketer tricks. Right. Yeah, right on. Mm -hmm. Matt. So, so two questions. First is I think you could probably sell this to the high school kids who want to <laughs> uh, uh, reach out. But, uh, you mentioned sentiment analysis. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you're doing in-house or is are you using an API for that? Yeah, no, so Surfiki um, does sentiment analysis built in. So actually it does, um, oh well actually I don't want to mess up your presentation here. Um, it does like a crap ton of stuff. So there's basically, like anything you can do just about with, um, like the NLTK library in Python. So you heard that? NLTK to yeah. Be the yeah, okay. yeah, to do like tons of tons of stuff. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question. Just yeah. A couple quick questions. Uh, for the LinkedIn, did you um, are you using the API and it, was there a time uh, limit for the where you can grab the data? Yeah. So for the the company information, no, excuse me, for the Person information, I am using the API, and there's, um, I'm using a Ruby gem just because it's like it's easy. It returns a hash of like everything that you can get from someone's public LinkedIn profile, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so, and I think that's literally called LinkedIn, and it's a Ruby gem. Um, for the company information, I had to create a custom scraper in Python uh, to get that information out, or at least I did before, um, so I could get literally everything off the page. And what was the rest of the question? Uh, just another follow-up question, which was uh, for Tablet, what was the, uh, I didn't know that it could uh, sync up with Mongo. What was it? No, it doesn't. So what I have to do is I have to basically export to like CSV or Excel and then do it. At least not in the, yeah. Make sure you use control and line in things on that, right? 
it's a tough one for me. Yeah, it's, it's stupid. But you know, you write a script for that and then once and then you're good. Okay. So right on. Yes sir. The back. You said Sufiki is free for now. What do you mean by it? for now? Yeah, so I probably just said that without thinking. Um, you can access the developer API for free right now. Like literally if you go to surfiki.com, you just click moments. sign up. Yeah, then you can you can get in there for free and play around with the developer API, which we just released about a month ago. And then we created also uh, something called Surfiki Refine, which is a way to manipulate data in Elasticsearch indexes. Um, so you can use like, if you want to, Surfiki as a data source for that, or really anything where you have Elasticsearch. So that's another tool that we built on top of that. And that's free and open source. Available now. Yes, sir. How should you deal with data conflicts either, uh, just an example, so-and-so's email address, Twitter says one thing, LinkedIn says another, Surfiki says, well, maybe something else. Or yeah. LinkedIn says two things that are completely. So, that's a good question. So far, I haven't, like, I'm not dealing with enough data at this point to have to worry about that, just to be quite frank. And where it starts is, like, I'll create a customer record inside our CMS, and then I'll manually, like, go out and get their LinkedIn profile and all this kind of stuff uh, right now because I have not yet found a good automated way for that exact reason. Right, like I'm Robert Dempsey, there's like a metric ton of Robert Dempsey's. How does some script know that like I'm talking about me and not somebody else? Right, it's, it just doesn't. So unless I have more information on that person to begin with, then I can't fully automate the, um, the, the data gathering. So what I'll do is I'll do like a manual plug-in check kind of. Um, plug-in check, is that even right? Anyway, I'll put it in and then all of my little robot scrapers will go to work at that point. So it's sweet. Right on. So, you're scraping, you're scraping, oh, sorry. So, so Robert will be around and we'll take a break. I will be around after the next one. So, just give him a round of applause. And I have like two little water bottles, is all I could fit in my bag. So, oh, first, first two to get them. Go! Yeah. <laughs> so, um, our, our next speaker is Travis Pines, a software engineer at uh, Barico. And he's going to be talking about another open source project called uh, Clavin, which is for geospatial analysis. Yeah. Did you get that right? Yeah. Great. So, welcome, welcome, Travis. I'm Travis Penny. Um, I'm a software engineer. I do a lot of work with geospatial. Databases, big data, and I'm going to go over a open source project called Clavin. And essentially, Clavin is uh, wait. What I'll go over is what Clavin is, a demo, and also showing like some enhancements with it using OpenStreetMap. So, Clavin is essentially a uh, it's, it's a way to get locations out of uh, documents. It's a geo parser and geo tagger, and um, you can extract location names and resolve against a, um, a gazetteer. And the gazetteer we use is geonames.org, which is basically collates, you know, GNIS, um, NGA geonames, a whole bunch of different data sets, open data sets. And Clavin is open source, it's Apache 2.0 license, and you can also run it in Hadoop. This is kind of under the hood of what's going on. You have text documents come in. Either you have them in, a whole bunch of them in Hadoop on HDFS, or you can have them streaming in. Um, and they hit a third-party name entity recognizer, like Stanford ENER or Apache, I think it's NLP. And this returns a list of location names. And from that, you, you resolve the location names against the Lucene index, and you get back your structured geodata. And it can handle ambiguous references like Springfield, Illinois, when there's like 25 Springfields, um, Springfield, Massachusetts also. Um, typos, phonetic spellings, um, different alternate names. Um, and let's see. So here's some of the stats. It has about 75% accuracy. It's about five, or it runs about 100 locations per second 
for a single thread, and then of course you can put this on a Hadoop cluster, um, and also it's open source. I already said that. So let me show you a demo of. I'm gonna rock it out real. So let's see. So, before I was talking about there can be ambiguous names, because you can have a location like Paris, you know, Texas, Paris, um, like France, and there's probably, I don't know how many Paris are, there's many of them. So, one technique it uses is look at the population name. Um, if it's a really high population, like Paris, when you talk about Paris, most likely you're talking about Paris, France, unless you have some other context. So. I want to show you an example of so okay is that is that better yeah okay so I want to resolve these locations um, so you can see where it resolves I mean it's resolving in Massachusetts so it's able to figure out Springfield, in that case, uh, it's Massachusetts. So, let's see. So, in this case, you see it resolves there. So, it's able to pick that up in the context. So, um, so that's like one way it does it. You can look at what clusters around it and then resolve those types of locations. So let me give it, kind of throw something else, kind of a monkey wrench at it. Um, I met Paris Hilton in London. So Paris is, that's a pretty common name, or, you know, well known. <laughs> Unfortunately, well uh, known. I never actually met Paris Hilton in London, but. Uh, so you can see in this case, let me move this back out. It only resolves London because it knows that Paris Hilton is the actual name in that context. Does that have an entity recognition? Yeah, yeah. So it uses like, you can use different ones. There's like commercial ones, there's open source ones. So this one's using an open source one to do that. Which um, um, I think it's, I don't I, that's a good question. I think it's, um, I don't know if it's Stanford or is it Apache NLP. I, I'll get back to you on that. Um, but it's the open source one. Um, so if you said like I stayed at the Paris Hilton, like in hmm. see what happens. See what happens. Yeah. So is there a Paris? I guess there's a Paris Hilton name or something. Yeah. So in yeah. yeah, so where wherever this lat long is, I'll look it up. It's interesting. Two point two is about right. Yeah. So what what do you see as the the use cases? How are you using it? How are how are you seeing your your sort of adopter using it? For what's what what's the end outcome? Oh, so right now there's like. MIT Media Lab is using it to do kind of like analytics on news. There's a lot of different companies that. Have, you know, so like plot news stories. Yeah, exactly. And just seeing like where yeah where things are happening in news stories, and um, so we're seeing a lot of interest from like um, lots of different industries. Um, so essentially, this was created because um, my company they were doing this is before I joined the company they were doing a um, a demo. And for some reason, they weren't able to get a commercial version of this in time. So, this, so the guy's name, Charlie Greenback, I guess he just wrote his own. And it ended up becoming its own project, which is pretty amazing. So, um, and I just, I just started working on it a couple months ago. Um, actually, found out about it by just going to a, like a GODC meetup. And that's like what the slides are based on. So that's where I met Charlie Greenbacker and then got, joined the company after that, a couple months after that. So. Um, so yeah, that's, I would look up Paris Hilton location, there's definitely a location name to that. So let me show you one more 
demo, and I'll get back to the slides. Um, I'll do a CNN um, flood Boston Philippines. So th this is something where it has more text, or I want to actually try to extract more text. So resolve locations. So you see in this case, hmm. inside the article, there's a name of Boston, which you would think Boston should resolve to Boston, but it's talking about a village in the Philippines called Boston. If we go back. And that was ridiculously fast. Was that cached? Or? No. No, huh. it, it's pretty fast. You do yeah. 100 per second lookups um, per document. That's way less than the same. Yeah. <laughs> So if I go search on here, let me search for Boston. So yeah, there you see, Bafa. Can you read that? The villages of Boston got till. So, but yeah, you can like anyone can go on the web page and like demo it. And I mean, there's probably there's bugs in it also, but um, <laughs> you find bugs, do a you know do a GitHub, set up a uh, pull request. But uh, so it's totally open source as many bits as we want to put against it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have some commercial stuff, but you know, the main thing is kind of like an open source model. But uh, so, let me go back to full screen slice. So, what I've done? Oh crap. So what I've done is actually, so the gazetteer is based on geonames.org, so you know, I was like, you know, why not use a different gazetteer? And it, is anyone familiar with OpenStreetMap? Yeah. Okay. So OpenStreetMap is essentially like a wiki map of the world. Um, it's about 2 billion nodes, it's about 21 gigs compressed for the full planet dump. And uh, basically what I did was create a program to kind of look for nodes. So the way OpenStreetMap is set up, you have nodes, ways, and relations. And nodes can have arbitrary key value pairs. And um, so what I'm doing is looking at nodes that have places or names in them. And so here's the planet file. Um, I'm using a program, it's an open source program called Osmosis. It's a Java program to pull, to read the protocol buffer file. And I wrote it as like a simple Python script, like a SAX parser that takes what it detects from the nodes that have places and then pulls out that data. And it puts it in a format that Clavin understands. Um, so, of course, you can get, on, get it from GitHub there. So, it generates about 2.4 million entries of places. And you can use that as a lookup. So, it's basically an example. You can use other different data sets and combine them together. Um, I would just one caveat is, the license of OpenStreetMap is like open database license, and I would take a look at that before mixing it with other stuff. Um, so kind of the feature is use, you know, I want to do line strings, so you can like resolve roads, as well as like administrative boundaries, because most things that, I mean, a, a place is really can be a whole polygon, like a city. It's not just like a point. And so most, most of the um, resolvers just, you know, resolve to a point, but I think that's the kind of the future for doing because ah, gazetteers. So, in the last part of the talk, I, I was going to I was talking about giving tips on how to like work in the cloud or working with big data. And one thing is really useful is they actually use spot pricing. Is has anyone used EC2? Amazon EC2? Does anyone use spot pricing on EC2? So, I wrote a hack on top of Chef to like Chef Knife to actually use spot pricing. And you can see the difference between the pricing. And it makes it really economical if you want to uh, do any type of like big data analysis. So I'm using that. What's the basic idea for spot pricing? Um, so normally it costs 82 cents an hour. So M2 X, 2X large is like 32 gigs of RAM. Pretty hefty machine. And normally it's fairly expensive to run a cluster. But if you're using spot pricing, 
it's like seven cents an hour. It's almost like it's a, off peak. Yeah, basically, yeah. some people yeah. uh, pre-purchase or reserve machines, and then when they no longer need them, they can sell them back to the market, and then they go yeah. to the marketplace. People can bid on them, and then they get the lowest. You, you can bid at like a spot yeah. price at point seven, but if someone outbids you, that machine will go away. Uh, so you have to, you may want to bid a little bit higher if you want to keep it around a little bit, or make your if you have like a smart script yeah. that knows can come and go, and you always want to keep a note that's that has your stuff on it that's good as permanent, yeah. and then you can run your scripts and then uh, bring them online. You yeah. Optimize also, your pricing. Also, uh, normally uh, Amazon limits you unless you make a special mm -hmm. request to 20 instances on right, right. a spot. Yeah. And I have 100 instances, yeah. and that really gives you a lot. Of yeah. Proof. Yeah, it's really nice. Like if you're doing any type of really data analysis, just to use it to test things out or test out clusters. And one thing that's important if you're doing that, if you need to build something on the fly, you want to be able to do ingestion really quickly. So I wrote like a really quick program called Hurl, and I'm still thinking of a logo of it. Does anyone have, does anyone have any ideas? Um, I was thinking like a Mr. Yuck symbol or something. But, uh, so essentially, Hurl is Hadoop and Curl together, and most people are familiar with Curl. So it's basically you're like, I have this thing off the web, I wanted to put it directly into Java, and then, or into HDFS. And the thing is, it's like this planet file is like 21 gigs. It's like it takes you just as long to download it, and then you have to like push it to Hadoop. And I was like, I didn't want to do that, so I just wrote a little hack. So you can check it out on GitHub. So basically, here's the command. I'm saying, okay, make this on Hadoop. Use Hurl, or I renamed it from Curl. Uh, someone told me Hurl, so I thought that's much better. So this is actually downloading it directly into HDFS, this protocol buffer file. And it takes nine minutes. So I just I'm using that that spot instance. It took nine minutes, so it's about thirty-seven six megabyte per second writes directly in the HDF. So you think about how fast that is. Normally that's the speed you get on your local network, just copying stuff. And that's pretty that's pretty good for the web or for the web in HDFS, unless someone has seen faster stuff. I don't know. Um, so conclusion. Use spot instances because they're really cheap. It's great for doing like data analysis or just munging big data. Also, you want to be able to ingest data quickly because you know you're setting stuff up on the fly. These things are very transient. They'll spike in prices. It can blow everything away. So you just keep in mind everything can be blown away. And also, you know, if you find any bugs, you know, put do some uh, issues, do some pull requests. I'm happy to uh, check it out and. Um, so this is the website, playven.barricotechnologies.com. You can do check out your own demos. Playven is a Twitter handle. Uh, Charlie Greenbacker is the main developer, product owner. This is my Twitter name. This is my company's Twitter name. And that's it. We're on like four gigs. Um, from in the geo names, I believe is around it's like 120 meg zip file or something, and then it ingests and it blows up to about four gigs for the loose Yeah, relatively small. You said that your app received 75% yeah. of the inaccuracy, so you can maybe improve it? Um, Right, yeah, so that's like the, the F score. Um, right now, it's, there's, no, um, no feedback. there's no feedback loop right now. I mean, that's something that we're looking to do and something, you know, have, have a way to, you know, if you find something wrong, like be able to fix it and have that come back into the system, but that doesn't exist right now. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Gennady Nordic. He's uh, a, a team lead here at Atlas. And uh, take it away. Buddy. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody, for coming here today. Again, my name is Gennady Nordic. Most guys here call me G. I'm one of the lead engineers here working on, uh, on a lot of our web products. So today, I'm going to be talking about how we track application usage. Um, so, just a quick background. What does Atlas do? We make sharing widgets, social sharing, and follow widgets and the like that people deploy on 14 million domains today. 
Um, one of the apps that we work on is actually an analytics app that you can do through a website, you can do through a RESTful API, get your analytics. So today I'm going to talk about, within the analytics app, how do we actually track what people do within the analytics application. So here's a couple of the screenshots, screenshot of the analytics app that we put out. Um, this is a email that we distribute as well because that's part of the conversation we send uh, analytics digest to people that want to receive it in their inbox, login screen, all that good stuff. This is all again, it's all free, it's all open for anybody that wants to use the tools, look at the analytics, there's a demo that's open on the website as well. So what do we want to, what do we really care about, what do we want to track? Uh, we care about things like page loads, you know, who, who what reports are people running? Um, how often do people log in? Um, how often do we, or how many emails do we send out on a weekly basis? How many of those get open? How many people actually click on stuff within the email? So all those different um, usage metrics that we care about in the context of our analytics application. So some other requirements, you know, it's got to be able to handle a good amount of data. And for us, 250,000 events a day is not huge, but I think it's pretty big. Um, we want to be able to query this information either ad hoc, present a nice interface. But this, it has to be very flexible because we may add new events in the future we may not think of today. So this, whatever the system that we're talking about has to be extensible, flexible, and scalable. Right? Well, since you know today we're talking about how we're doing this, so if we only had a system in place that could accomplish like some of this stuff, and how uh, we do. So, you know, today it's really about using the tools that are at your disposal, tools that may be already available within your company. So this, we had a tool, a pretty significant system that, that was already available for us that could accomplish a lot of these tasks. So I'm gonna talk about Hydra. I think maybe many of you have heard of Hydra before. What is Hydra? Is a multi-headed creature? The Hercules fought, you know? Is it the, uh, the fictional terrorist organization? No. Hail Hydra. Yeah. <laughs> well, so Hydra in our world is a distributed computing system that we built from the ground up in-house. So uh, we could probably spend a whole day just talking about that. But you know, at, at a high level, it takes many types of inputs, typically logs, it doesn't have to be logs. Um, you can run, you write your uh, jobs to process those logs, parse the logs, create a queryable data structure out of it, and then you get a query for the data, and we have a HTTP API that we use to actually query that data. So, typically what we wind up doing is, within the application, we write a bunch of logs, you know, somebody clicked on a report, uh, somebody opened an email, and you know, in the email tracker, you know, when you open up an um, email, there's an image that loads, a pixel that loads, it hits our servers, we write a log entry for that. So basically, anything that we care about, we write a log entry. All right, then, within the Hydra, actually, let me back up for a second. So a couple of things, this, you guys may be curious about what these all mean. So, typical log entry, you got time element, you got the environment, which is production in this case. We could do the same on other environments like our test QA system. You know, what is the event type? So we have a login event, we have a email send event, so we sent an email. Email open event, for example. Who is the publisher, which is like a customer in our world. Um, Who is the user that was interacting with that. So all that stuff we can track so we can query for that later. So a query data from Hydra, I mentioned we do have an HTTP API. This is kind of a snippet of that. Um, again, we could talk about syntax for a whole day, about all the different cool things you can do on Hydra. But you could do you know, aggregate functions, you can do pivoting and grouping, similar to what you've seen in SQL-like query language. So, uh, But this is just three, HTTP API. A job is basically telling us that this is like our data for this specific purpose, maybe for this specific application, or for this set of data, and we can have an infinite number of jobs within the context of Hydra. So this is the one specific one which contains our tracking data for the analytics. 
for the analytics usage. And there's a whole bunch of other syntax there. So we query for data on a day and other stuff there. So without getting too much into the details, voila, this is basically the dashboard that we produced that has a bunch of different filters. So, you know, website, which is, you know, like a specific section of the thing that we care about, how many logins, there's some other stuff that we could break it down by, maybe by break it down by customer. So, you know, you have the normal bar graph here. Um, yeah, so this is pretty cool. We could do a bunch of different filtering. We could also, like I mentioned, we can do ad hoc queries on this, on this stuff. If we want to do some deeper analysis that may not have built, been built in this app. This app itself is PHP based. Um, again, it just makes calls out to the Hydra query API. So it's just some um, HTTP calls through PHP. Pretty simple. Um, the client side code here is very, very light. It's very little JavaScript. So this is, this is pretty simplistic. So really not that difficult to build. Um, so some other thoughts that I had just thinking through this presentation is, you know, it is again about using the tools that are at your disposal. Let's say if we didn't have Hydra at our disposal, would we build a distributed computing system to do this? Probably not. It's probably an overkill for the task, but it was available. And it had, you know, taken care of a lot of the, you know, the log parsing. We didn't have to write a lot of code for that, for querying for the data. Pretty simple to write. Um, you know, I know I work a lot with SQL in the past, and you know, you got your schema design, but then you change your mind in the future, and you have to worry about migration scripts. So we didn't have to deal with that at all in the context of Hydra. So it made a lot of things a lot easier for us. Um, some of the thoughts I was just doing some research the other day. Uh, I think uh, Cloudera Impala is doing something similar, or in the sense that it's a SQL like query language on top of Hadoop. So if, let's say if you have Hadoop in place and you want to make it accessible to your some of your developers that are used to working with SQL, consider that. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts. And in the context of, me of uh, metrics, well, this happened today. This is completely unrelated, but I wanted to throw this in here. So this is just talking about number of requests for one of our APIs, one of our RESTful APIs. And we tuned some caching at the CDN layer today. We have some really cool CDN that actually caches our dynamic content. And we tuned caching and we see, yeah, so a significant 40-50% drop in actual requests to us, so it's all handled at the CDN level. So this really speaks to the metrics. We are a very metrics-driven company. We try to measure everything. So stuff like this is really awesome for us to see big accomplishment for us, kind of a small victory, really, but a nice accomplishment, and we can measure it, and we can celebrate. So metrics do matter, so track stuff. And that's it, pretty, pretty short and sweet. I know we can spend a long time talking about Hydra and the like. I thought I'd leave it there, but any questions? Source. Uh, soon. soon. I am working on it. Really? Yes. I was joking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you don't know, Hy Hy Hydra is, is a tool that, that we use here at Addis. It, it, uh, it helps us process three and a half billion events per day. And it um, you know, is, is, is an interesting parallel to the sort of Hadoops of the world. It's a little bit different approach. I've given some talks on it here. You can look them up on our Big Data DC website for, to, if you want to know more. Um, so, so next up, we've got... Uh, uh, Terry Johnson from SAIC. He's the, the chief scientist and cyber strategist for SAIC, so we're really lucky to have him here. So, thank you, Terry. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. This is my first big data uh, event. I started my career back in 75. I was a scientific programmer using Fortran for uh, research. I uh, started my other career as a computer scientist in 85 <laughs> to, uh, uh, this is about, I'm trying to summarize in 40 seconds or less, a 44 year career. Uh, until 1992, as a computer scientist, Computer Scientist Corporation, I was uh, heading up their high performance computing lab and artificial intelligence uh, work at that time. 
Uh, in 92 to 98, I was Argonne National Laboratory, nuclear physics lab, where we, uh, where I was working for decision information scientists. Uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, again, computer scientist. Uh, 98 to uh, 2006, I had my own company, Expert Decision Systems, doing work for the National Security Agency under contract. It was a one company uh, special project. Uh, and uh, then I went to Lockheed Martin in 93 until 2009, where I was the chief technologist for them. And then I went over to UCOM, US European Command, to Stuttgart, Germany in 2010. I stayed for two years, 2011, as their uh, lead for cyber attack uh, in, the, in the European theater. Came back here to SCIC in 2011. Uh, for the last year, I've been at the State Department. And that's why I've got this rule as cyber strategist. So I'm going to try and convince you tonight in 10 minutes or less that the biggest concern we have as a nation is cyber strategy, cyber security. And that the, probably the best use of, of big data is in trying to solve this uh, uh, big uh, cyber security problem that we've got. So let me uh, uh, break this into four parts. Uh, let's see, which, to the right? I'm oh, sorry, that's not the this is the right area. Which one? The keyboard. The keyboard. Old school style. <laughs> this is the wrong. This is the wrong data set. Wrong slide set. Can you uh, put the other one on? I said later in the day. So anyway, let me just talk to this. Uh, I'll get to these other slides later. But uh, there's four basic areas in cybersecurity where big data is really is really key to solving the problem. Now, the first is identity management. Uh, the, the core area in identity management is, uh, you know, basically understanding who a person is. And in, in computer uh, security, yeah, that's the one, yeah. We uh, basically give that person a, uh, a, a, a record in the computer for identifying that person and a credential. We call that a cert, a cert that uh, carries along with them, either through uh, encrypted communications or through uh, access to the system or to un, un, uh, encrypting data stored in, in, in a stationary mode. Uh, now, along with that, we can use uh, things to, to identify personally identify personal personal information verification (PIV). Things like biometrics, the retina, the uh, fingerprint, DNA, credit reports, of course, driver's license, social security, uh, social media sites, phone numbers, uh, websites, uh, email addresses, criminal records, physical addresses, social security number, uh, birth, marriage certificates. So that all this data, you see, uh, worldwide is useful in understanding who we're talking with and, and uh, in verifying who a person really is. And it's very important, as we'll see in coming down to uh, attribution in computer security, because if we're going, if we're, if we're under attack, and for example, say the uh, Chinese, like when I was at Lockheed Martin, broke into our servers at Lockheed Martin, they sold the blueprints to the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, two years later, they announced that they're going to have air superiority in 20 years. Uh, let me um, uh, mention that we need to understand who the bad actors are out there. We need to understand uh, what their motive, motives are, what they want to get from us, what their behavioral patterns are over time, what they're doing in other places at the same time as they're attacking us. Uh, we need to understand from all this data worldwide, uh, we, under, we, we need to coordinate that with terrorism data because terrorists are now using uh, cyber attack to steal from us as well. Uh, there's really three things in cyber where we are, are losing. We're losing, it's called the CIA. We're losing confidential information like the Joint Strike Fighter plans. We're losing uh, data integrity where they corrupt data on the servers or other, other places. And we're losing accessibility when we do denial of service attacks, and they prevent us from being able to get to our uh, uh, services or our data. So, uh, with that, let me turn to the second area where it's uh, very important for big data is cybersecurity. Uh, that's fraud detection and prevention. Now, I don't know if you uh, watched the news about two months ago when you when there was this attack. It was kind of a low-profile news report about the ATM machines that were hacked, and there was a $45 million loss from ATM cash. 
out of machines in a, in a geographical area where a, a cyber criminal had the plans to, uh, to, to do this massive heist. He, of course, used a hacker to find the vulnerability to get into the system and the developer to write the code, of course, to tell the machines to spit out the cache across the entire region. Uh, that was done very quickly. And, and so I think you'll start to see now that the three criteria of, cyber, of, of a big database are what cybersecurity has. We have velocity, the three, three Vs of, of a big data being velocity, variety, and volume. We have the, the velocity of things happening very quickly. We have the variety of all kinds of data about bad actors, malware, about events, about uh, um, uh, uh, intrusions, vulnerabilities. And we have uh, lots of volume because all these computers spit out events. And uh, you can imagine now if, if uh, one uh, log is 100 records in a day times 1,000 routers like we have at State Department times uh, the uh, firewalls we have, which are again in the thousands, times the other uh, logs from other things like the CPUs. But the amount of data that's spit out even in one organization like State Department worldwide, because we have, we have networks in uh, the U.S., but of course we have in every country worldwide, and it basically all forms one big open net. So it's a very big footprint, and the amount of data generated in a day is uh, quite phenomenal. So the third area I'd like to talk about is uh, governance, risk, and compliance. And we have this thing called the National Cyber, Cyber Security Center, which has to deal with uh, intelligence data from the CIA and NSA and others uh, in terms of developing policy for cybersecurity, uh, data from law enforcement, the FBI, local, state police, uh, Defense Department, who is actively engaged, as you know, at Cyber Command in cyber war planning and actively engaged in cyber war today as we speak, although it's not very high profile in the news. Civil, like at the Department of State, where I'm working now, and uh, others, and that's a, a lot of information has to be pulled together uh, in terms of uh, uh, governance, risk, and compliance. Again, big data serves a big role in pulling together that big picture. The fourth area, and final area, is security management. And that's these events coming from the firewalls, from the intrusion detection systems, from the, the routers. Einstein is a nationwide system, which uh, uh, is soon in Einstein 3, we'll be looking at deep packet inspection of every packet that comes in this country. And we'll be uh, sending out an event when anything suspicious is found. And all the uh, patterns are basically classified at top secret because we don't want the, the bad actors to know that we know their patterns of attack, their patterns of malware. Sorry, did you say every packet into the nation or every packet into state? Department? No, every, every packet into the nation. Uh, the, goal, the goal of the Einstein is to surround our global U.S. network, CONUS and, and OCONUS, with these Einstein sensors that will, will receive every, will, will, will have every packet pass through them uh, for uh, real-time full packet inspection. And of course, any pattern, any malware footprint, any thing which, any, any behavior of a bad actor that we pick up on is going to flag an event that we have to then put together in terms of a global operating system, I mean, global operating picture of what's happening worldwide. Uh, you know, sometimes actors like China and Russia have many things going on at once. We need to understand where everything is happening at once so that we can uh, counter the threat, not from an individual network or a point of, of uh, of attack, but from the global attack that's going on around us. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of charts now that uh, had to do with this last one, number four, in terms of security management. If you look at the uh, data loss since 2004, it's been going up steadily, it's continuing to go up steady. If you look at the uh, sampling of attack types, we have uh, SQL injection, spear phishing, denial of service, physical access, Trojan software, XSS, others. Uh, these are different uh, uh, sectors we've identified these from January, February, March of 2012, giving us an idea where, where this data, again, has been compiled and, and used to be able to see these uh, patterns over time. We have a, a view of uh, spam. Here we are looking at uh, the average byte size, uh, the uh, percentage of the uh, image spam, uh, zip, czar, spam, 
the domain equal to domain, uh, so that we can we can understand from this big data what's happening from this global perspective of uh, the spam across. Because spam is a big problem in, in every network. Uh, it's one of the biggest uses of uh, of uh, bandwidth. Uh, phishing targets. It shows here the uh, auctions, financial institutions, payment. Uh, Social networks, nonprofit organizations, credit cards, government organizations, scanners, fax, partial services, by all color coded by uh, uh, 2009 to 2012. Uh, spam origins, you see here that, of course, Russia is number one on spam, but interestingly, you don't see China at all in this, which I, I know China is heavily involved in uh, attacks. We see that all the time, a massive number. Uh, I, I come in the mornings and see the attacks from China. A uh, drop of spam after botnet bust. Here we see a nice chart that shows us that uh, uh, globally that after we did the botnet bust, you see, you start to see the decline. Again, this is big data supporting uh, the, the, the results of actions to uh, try to, to uh, counter the uh, cyber uh, activity, the threats. Reports of vulnerabilities, you see, this is almost exponential when this is growing on us. Imagine what it's going to be like in 2020. So, uh, and of course, here's the uh, web vulnerabilities by attack with the uh, cross site scripting, SQL injection in the middle, and then the other stuff below that. So, uh, I'm hope, hopefully in the last uh, few minutes I've been able to convince you that the cyber threat is real and probably the number one uh, threat to the nation as we speak. Uh, if there's any use of big data which warrants our attention, it is the cybersecurity data and, and the cybersecurity problem. And uh, how am I doing on time? Another couple of minutes? Wrap up and ask for questions. Okay, well, let me just uh, say a few points here on the, on the wrap-up slide, that uh, uh, there's a lot going on in this area of cyber and big data. I don't know if you made it to SEC, the, the GovSec conference a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the National Science Foundation was there with uh, 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 the, their, their, their program for building a, a, a big data community to consolidate the cyber data from all of our industry, all of our government, and all of our academic systems so that we can uh, start to get a picture of where we're vulnerable in the United States. In fact, they had the speaker, which was the former secretary of DH, DHS, uh, uh, Michael Chernoff, uh, address this. And it was a, 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 actually, this was actually the spunk part of it. Uh, Splunk is the database we use at state for collecting events from uh, cyber uh, monitors, from Einstein, from all that. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, the intent that we can take that data, the big data, from all these different things and, and uh, make ourselves uh, more secure. So with that, let me open up for questions. So I agree with you that you know cyber you know cyber threats from a militaristic standpoint you know like military threats possibly against our country um, is a major issue as you mentioned right I mean it's been happening for quite some time and then people are stealing data from private companies so at the same time right so we hear like you know I made the joke about prison but yeah you know, it, it is a very real thing and so people are concerned when you're talking, you know, deep pattern inspection of everything that comes into the United States, there's always been this, you know, how can we have security, but at the same time maintain privacy and, like, constitutional rights of Americans, right? So how, I mean, how do you see that being able to possibly be balanced out? Or is it even possible to kind of balance Well, you know, it's always going to be a trade-off. You have to decide uh, whether you want to have, you want to be more... Uh, risk, uh, tolerance of, of attack and, and loss, or you want to be more risk tolerant of loss of uh, individual uh, privacy and, and uh, 
confidentiality of personal information. And so we have, we have as a nation, have to decide. This goes back to the Snowden event where he uh, took the data from NSA in Hawaii and, and, and gave it basically to the Russians at this point where he's going to take asylum in Russia, I believe. So it, so it seems. We have to decide uh, the balance between the, the issues of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and the issues of, uh, you know, of the loss of that. You have this, this, this uh, uh, point in which, at the State Department, for example, we have data which is uh, at risk, but the value of that data, if we look at risk as the multiplication of the impact of a loss, so in this case, if somebody died, does, does it cause financial harm, times the probability it will happen, you need to weigh that risk uh, with the security measures you put on the information. So we could make data so secure, I mean, we could have several layers of, of uh, uh, biometrics, a CAC card with a certificate, uh, an RSA token for syncing with the clock. Uh, you know, all these things in place to protect a piece of data to the point where it becomes almost impossible for anybody to get a job done because it's so tedious to get that data. So the trade-off now is how much do you loosen that up? How much, how much do you let the how must you tolerate that risk that you might lose it in order, in order to be able to get the job done? The State Department, we talk with uh, every nation pretty much uh, on the Internet. We can't really cut off communications with the world. So we have this d dilemma. Do we keep open communications with the world on the Internet and have this constant attack and constant loss or, or threat of loss? Or do we tighten it up so tight? I mean, we could actually uh, assign the IPs so that you know, nation states, embassies could only, uh, and embassies could only talk to us by, by limited uh, secure ch channels with SSL encryption from, from IP address to IP address, so that it's basically impossible to break into. You see, you see the dilemma. That blocks out people's uh, accessibility to the State Department. Yeah. Fundamental asymmetry we have with some of these overseas threats is that our agencies are not allowed to spy on behalf of industry. Theirs are. Is that asymmetry even tenable? Is Einstein going to restore balance, or is that asymmetry just something that nothing is going to hold? You know, I'm failing the ocean of the teaspoon. You know, I have something I need for the diplomats to, to deal with. It's, it's the highest level policy question, but it is. I don't know if there's an answer. I, I think the government is working with industry to try to identify protected assets and help them. But I think no, 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 no. This is this is spy offensive, on behalf, I, I, offensive on behalf of industry. U.S. law says we can't do it. And it's, this, 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 is, this is the highest pay grade. Well, I, th I, think, I think we might gonna might veer off of uh, big data here and get into public yeah. policy. Yeah. So, so why don't we give uh, a big hand? And uh, last, last but but certainly not least, we have Srini from uh, Global Dynamics IT, and he is their their chief architect of their big data solution. So, um, a strong presentation to wrap up with. Thank you, Shri. Right. Yeah, great talks today. Good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Srini Nanduri. I'm working at uh, General Dynamics Information Technology as uh, the chief architect. Looking mostly, I'm, I'm helping them uh, support their big data strategy and really the big data practice at this point of time. So my talk kind of goes in line with uh, some of the conversations we had before. I'll not get into the privacy and other pieces of it, but really from a technology perspective, how can social media analytics really provide public safety, right? There's, this, there's an application we're building for humanitarian assistance. How can you really get into that and provide some, some support based on all the social media data that we have? Uh, I think the, the key here is, uh, yeah, by the way, Sorry. it's washed out slides, don't worry about it. So, yeah, from Windows to Mac, right? Uh, so, uh, it's basically, if you understand all this text, but uh, we, we're in the social media revolution right now, right? <laughs> There's so much social media data that's at us, like Twitter data sets, Facebook, uh, Google. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it doesn't matter. 
So, but, but at least look at this picture, right? So, <laughs> we're, so the, the fact is we are in a social media revolution. There's so much social media data that's, that, uh, that is at us, right? And this goes back to the four Vs. I don't want to get into the four Vs, but it's big data, right? You are looking at a lot of the data that's coming at you. So the question is, norm, normally the traditional analytical tools can look at this data, but I think they break down when you're looking at data, when you connect to a Twitter file, right? How do you consume the data and really process that information? And, and I think this is, this is where it gets into uh, the, the four Vs, and uh, I, I think this is where it gets into the key aspects where social media can really be used, right? The four uh, use cases or five use cases I have here. One is basically we, we saw a lot of activity during elections where predicting the outcomes of an election, like who's going to win. So I think that's, that's sentiment analysis. I think we have seen a lot of those use cases around it. But the other ones are like TV shows. TV is becoming more interactive now where you can tweet based on the hash keys of who you think is going to win and all that. And, and I, I think the other thing too is that there's a lot of product announcements and promotions and ads that are driven by the Twitter today, right? How do you really use social media to support some of those pieces too? And uh, yeah, I think, I, I think uh, you can really drive some heat maps in terms of the disease outbreaks on, based on what people are really talking from Twitter's side. And I think this is key too, right? There's a lot of investment decision, this algorithmic trading that, that is a new way of looking at trading data sets where minute by minute you look at all these data sets that are coming in, be able to analyze and really be able to do some investment decision based on that. And the tool is doing that for you, right? Huge big data opportunity out there. But as you start getting into some of these things, and sorry for the slides, but in, social media is a great source for law enforcement and, and humanitarian assistance, right? If you look at it, like a uh, couple of examples, one of them is the state of Kansas. There was an article in USA Today where they talk about uh, basically gangs using Twitter for hiring, recruiting people for their gang activities, providing information updates to what people need to do. And also one of the key things is uh, sharing information. They're doing a lot, putting a lot of information online. It's, it's one of the million tweets that comes out, right, per second. So how do you really look at that? The other one is uh, there's a case of uh, Jared where the person who shot uh, Arizona uh, representative Gabriella and he was putting a lot of this anti-government stuff online before actually doing the crime, right? So how do you kind of track it? So I think this is where it gets into, can really law enforcement look at and mine through this all data coming in, right? It's a noise, it's a needle in the haystack kind of a problem from a big data standpoint. So I think this is where we, we started building the big data. We have a big data solution that we have today where it's based on Hadoop and, uh, and Accumulo. Yeah, so basically we, we monitor all the social media data sets. And I think it's classified as they can. That's right. <laughs> it's, you need to have clear list before you look at it, right? But, but from the technology perspective, we use uh, uh, Storm for ingesting all these Twitter data sets. We create all the topologies of where the data comes from. We connect to a Twitter firewall where the data is coming at a high velocity, right? We use Hadoop and Akimlo to really take the data, slice and dice, and store it in the system and MapReduce to really look through the data and run analytics on top of it, right? Uh, and it's basically, it's not just from a data ingest storage mechanism, but we also use to do for analyzing and finding relationships. So basically, it's not just one dimension of data coming from Twitter, but you, how do you take a data set coming from Twitter and map that to Facebook, right? Or map that to some of the other sources like YouTube and things like that. And really find those really relationships around how the data sets are actually connected together. Uh, and also they're running some really advanced analytics and I think as we all know Twitter close to 7% tweets are geolocated if you put in the privacy and you block your location most of the tweets are not so how do you really get information on the location because from humanitarian you need to have the data right if, if you are a person who's like a first responder who's trying to support a particular maybe an incident or an event that just happened how do you geolocate some people and really support them so I think you do see a lot of use cases and, and we are actually building some models where you can get geolocation not just from the tweet geolocation but also from the text data sets that are coming in. And I think this is a problem, this is a tough thing to crack is how do you really get beyond the Twitter hashtags, right? You know the hashtags are great but the only 30% of the tweets normally have a relevant hashtag so how do you get beyond that and really can be able to find more information based on the tweet itself. 
So a few use cases that we see is really applicable for some of the things I discussed, like crisis and disaster response. I think that's a huge, huge benefit for social media analysis, where you can really use it as a communication tool, but, but also the other way around, you can locate the victims and survey damages even before some of the first responders actually hit the ground, right? How do you look at some of the data that's actually out there? Uh, the other one, too, is monitoring and uh, listening to some of the, mostly on the sentiment analysis of and even that's actually happening, whether it's basically a, a protest or maybe there's a demonstration that's happening, but you really monitor and it's more of on a, not on a proactive basis, but at least you, you react and understand what the sentiment is of the crowd at that point of time. And the other thing too is uh, how do you predict uh, trends based on the historical data? I think you must have seen uh, some use cases on predictive policy, right? The experiment that the city of Santa Cruz was actually running where they looked at the historical data of all the crime mapping in the past 30, 40 years and start predicting what would be the crime, uh, maybe a location or maybe an event that could potentially happen in certain places. So, so using big data, really there's a potential in terms of not just historical, but really be able to apply some of the predictive models on top of it. And I think this is, this really gets into the point of uh, privacy. So how do you really how do you really get to the point where some of the discussion that we just had we had right how do you draw the boundary between what happens and how do you track some of those things from a tool perspective i think what we try to do is get everything public data set so it's not we don't get into any of the private data and twitter as you know it's all public data right so we mostly mine the public side of the information but but definitely there's there's uh, there's a privacy element to some of the things that discussed. Right? that was a quick talk thank you any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, uh, disaster recovery. I mean, it sounds really, really great, but I'm sort of limited in my imagination. Uh, that is, uh, so can you explain to me, because it seems like, okay, we're about to have a disaster right. somewhere in, in uh, Maryland right now because right. people are going to go without water for four days or right. longer. Right. And how is this, how, how are you going to data mine this uh, to look for Right. Doing so, something positive. So one of the examples, one of the data sets we mine is for Sandy Hurricane, right? When mm -hmm. the landfall ha was happening in Manhattan, what were people tweeting at that point of time? What were the keywords or what? You can really look at, like, from a basic example, I, I don't have the screenshots because I didn't get into the details, but something as simple as we could, we got the word clouds of what the people were tweeting at that point of time and look at there is problem with water or flooding and things like that, right? And then you can go one level down and start looking for information, like doing some basic analytics on top of the data and say the heat maps within Manhattan where people were having those issues, right? Flooding, for example. So just based on just the two levels of data, looking at some social media analysis, you can really understand what could be the potential scenarios that could be happening, right? But then how do you, uh, but okay, so let's say you have this nice little heat map and it looks all really great and you can right. show it to your friends and yeah. say, wow, man, this is cool. But how do you make the, uh, take that heat map and then translate that to something useful where, you know, you're actually making a difference? Right, so this is where I think the first response where based on the heat maps, you can look at some of the, and that, that, that is basically one set of data where you can... The deployment of limited resources. Right? Yeah, and, and also you, you can actually add in other sources like your 911 calls, right? Basically, the data that is coming in from some of the other sources could be complemented with something that you're looking for. And, and based on the heat map, basically limited resources, how do you deploy some of those people to really support some of those things you're looking so for? So are you working with people that will we are, deploy yeah. things? Yeah. So one of the things we were looking at from, uh, and, and right now this is uh, in the first phase of the, the implementation, but one of the use cases we're looking at is look at from a heat map perspective of where the zones are and base your first response based on some of those things. Too. So how do you support the areas that you know definitely have issues because there are a lot of people tweeting from that particular geolocation. Last question. Uh, how do you deal with the infrastructure problems? Because I know a bunch of guys who did the Sandy project who were basically mine Twitter after Sandy. And the big thing that every single one of the groups complained about was uh, the areas that were probably hit worst, they had no power for multiple days on end right. and cell phone towers. Well, it's simple. You can go with no tweets. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you have this black hole of tweets. Yeah. Absence of information. Yeah. Absence of information is hurricane detector. That is information on its own. But how can you deal with that in terms of 
I know there's a black hole, then how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that, that, that's a good question. Well, in, <laughs> in, in, in a long in a long term outage, what you do is you they they're they're they're, they're aware that this happened now, so they have mobile mobile power stations and mobile um, cell towers okay. that they'll they they I would I would say just imagination they can use the, the, the absence of information from certain areas as this is where we need to deploy cell towers and power information so we can get the information from the people. Yeah, and also to look at this as one tool, right? So for example, the first response is actually feeding information back to the yeah, yeah. to the command center too. So that would be the more uh, I would say authoritative source. When you're looking three days into a hurricane, right? Yeah, Where the power guys know they see the blackout coming. <laughs> <laughs> there go the tweets. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Shane.